Well, guys, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're glad that everybody made it out this evening. And, uh, man, it is a beautiful, beautiful day. And has been a couple beautiful days out there. A little cold in the mornings, but, man, it has been perfect throughout the day. And so I hope you've been enjoying it. And I uh, hope that everybody's well. We were a little down this morning, but I know we had a lot of folks that are being under the weather and a couple of folks that couldn't be here. So uh, just pray for those that are that are still dealing with illness and sickness. And, uh, you know, they're, they're telling us that COVID's making another run, another wave in a lot of places. So who knows what that's going to hold for us. But we're going to keep being careful and keep doing everything we can to protect ourselves and one another. So pray for those that are dealing with that as well. Uh, thankful for Miss Jan Deer having a, a very successful surgery this past week and uh, rehab is going well. Has she been to actual physical therapy? No. Not yet. It's coming she though, isn't it? She's got two weeks of them coming to the house. Been well, pray especially for her. The surgery is just the first part of it, the, all that physical therapy. Some of y'all have been there and you know that. Uh, so uh, so pray for Miss Jan as she continues to heal with all that. They did bend her knee 100% Friday. Isn't that amazing? And, and she, the, the person that done it couldn't believe that. Are you Man. sure she had a knee replacement? <laughs> <laughs> they got that thing angled there. Yeah. Uh, he, he didn't say that new knee was actually in her leg. It was just that off to the side. That's just not feasible. <laughs> that's, uh, that's something else. Wow. That's something else. Wow. Just the mere fact that they do a replacement, that they take Legos and put them in there and you know make it all work like it does is amazing. But how quickly they get everything going is even more amazing to me. So. Um, Okay. I went to my cancer doctor this past week, and everything, he said everything goes good, but my legs have been hurting me bad, and he told me a possibility it could be my back. Okay. So he's sending me to have an MRI run. Well, hopefully they'll find things right where they're supposed to be and nothing there that's not supposed to be there, but... Uh, I hadn't got a hadn't got a good doctor's report from you here in the last few weeks, so I'm looking forward to another good doctor's report. I, Miss Shirley, we'll, we'll be praying that that'll go just right for you. Okay. Any other prayer requests? I Great. Got one more treat in the morning. One more time, he's gonna. This will fully turn you into the Hulk, won't it? This ought to do it. <laughs> one more radiation treatment. Yeah, man. Well, I hope it, uh, we've been praying that that's been effective and that it'll. it'll Prove itself to be ultimately effective. So. What about Mr. Wayne Lemon? How's he doing? He's doing okay. He's staying real close to the house, and yeah, uh, and so. Miss Chris has, has talked to him a good bit, and he's hey. doing. Uh, Wayne Lemon, okay. Mr. Wayne. Uh huh. And uh, so he's. Miss Shirley's sister and brother-in-law <clears throat> are leaving in the morning, going back to Maryland. They've been here about ten days. <clears throat> Don't let Mr. Wayne get out. No, no, no. <laughs> she, she, she keeps him on a short leash, doesn't she? <laughs> and rightfully so. So that's he that's good. He wanted to drive last week. <laughs> <laughs> I got strokes about that. So <laughs> I went out too. Goodness. <laughs> I'm taking his car keys. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started with our Bible study tonight. Father in heaven, Lord, we do love you and we thank you for the day that you've given us and God the times and the opportunity we have had to come here and to worship you. We love you and we thank you for the day that you've given us and God the times and the opportunities we've had and that we still have to be together. And uh, to hear from your word, to study it together, and to, to grow in it as you would allow us to. So, God, would you help that to happen even this evening? God, we lift up all those that are sick, that are injured, uh, that are recovering. Father, those who are suffering in so many ways. God, we ask, Lord, that you would protect them where they can be protected by your will. And, Father, strengthen them by your power. And, Lord, that you would help them to recover and to, and to grow back to health and to, uh, to, to grow in, even in the times of suffering as you will allow Lord God, for this time that we have together as we wrap up the book of Hebrews, we thank you, Father, for the message that, that tells us that Jesus is above all else and, and everyone else. He is unique and, and is, is uh, totally tops above anything or anyone that would ever even dream of competing with him. It's no competition. And also that because of that, we can persevere and that we can stay in, in faith in him and not be swayed by the things that come to us in this life. God, help us now as we wrap up this great book, this great letter uh, from your word. Father, help us to understand it even a little bit more. Teach us what you want us to know. And God, take us from here to live it out in all that we learn and all that we know in you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Pray for our children, our youth tonight as they're uh, doing their activities. Pray that they would be being built up as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Well, guys, <laughs> the day we got COVID, the day, the 4th of July weekend, July 5th, that Sunday, we started in the book of Hebrews, and we, uh, with the exception of a couple weeks, we were in the hospital, and then um, another week with, uh, with Miss Jean's visitation, we've done a chapter a week which means that's been about 16 weeks or so now, uh, 13 chapters worth, including today. So uh, we're, we've been, I, I've learned a lot uh, in studying Hebrews to, to teach it in the Bible study. Hebrews is a book that I'd read many times through before, or even taken some classes in it, but you know, every time you come back to scripture, you learn more and more. And so uh, it's amazing, really, you know, even though it's been 16 weeks, it feels like, you know, we're just getting into it good, and here we are wrapping it up. And chapter 13 comes as a wrap-up. That's, that's what the, the chapter serves as in the body of the letter to the Hebrews, is to, to kind of wrap things up, to give a few more, um, you know, you might call them parting shots, but they're, they're, they're just quick-hitting lessons, quick-hitting encouragements and exhortations to, uh, to, to encourage the hearers that would hear the words from the book of Hebrews. And so uh, as, we, as we take a look at it together, let's look and start in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. And we'll read on all the way through the chapter together. Um, and so as we, as we see it, we read, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, excuse me, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who were mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned in, or excuse me, outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. May he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for in fact I have written to you quite briefly. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. 25 verses of wrapping up the letter. Um, you ever do that in a conversation where you've had that conversation? There's a couple more things that are on your mind, but you know you're having to wrap up the conversation. And so you say, hey, by the way, real quick, do this and do that and do this and do this. Or, hey, be sure to tell so-and-so about this such and such. 
we do that all the time. And of course, that, that happened here uh, in the letter to the Hebrews as well. Um, it's interesting to me that, you know, some of the things he says are things that us preachers have, have wanted to say, you know, maybe every time we speak. Uh, things about, hey, I've talked to you briefly. That may or may not always be true. <laughs> and he's gone on for 13 chapters. So, but it definitely was brief in the, in the sense of how much and how important what he was dealing with, uh, you know, how, how important all that was as he was dealing with it throughout the letter. Um, so let's, let's kind of work through that a little bit. Let's take a look at, at what he says as he does, um, as he does continue to, to wrap this letter up. And, uh, and let's see how it works here. So in verse 1, he said, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. I think above all else, when it comes to dealing with each other, we have to remember that if you've put your faith in Christ and I've put my faith in Christ, we are brother and sister or brother and brother or sister and sister in Christ. We have that familial relationship that God has given us. And it's not necessarily of our doing. It's something that he has done. He has adopted us into his family by salvation, and he has made us to be together. And so it's important that we continue to love one another. Now, brothers and sisters are supposed, they're meant to have good relationships. They're meant to have trust and love, and, and the idea of loving someone like a brother or sister should be a positive thing. We all know that in, in times we have situations in our lives where, you know, we, we don't maybe get, uh, get along as well with our brother or sister. And so maybe that relationship is not necessarily at the moment uh, one that we would use as an example. But when he talks about loving one another as brothers and sisters, he means to have mutual respect for one another, to have compassion and, uh, and, and to, to serve one another, to lift one another up and strengthen one another and uh, take care of each other as brothers and sisters would do. He goes on in verse 2 to say, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. In other words, not just those that are of the faith, but those who come to the group from outside the group, those who may or may not be um, people of faith just yet, those that are people who are maybe to be ministered to that might be led by God to come to the faith but he says, even though strangers show hospitality to them. And then he says something kind of interesting to us that goes into a part of the New Testament that we don't really talk about maybe often enough. And that's the idea of the presence and the activity of angels. He says, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Um, we know that throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well, God sends his messengers, and, and the angels are real. They're not just imaginary beings. They're not just some different animal or anything like that. I mean, we know from Scripture that they are absolutely real, that they are beings that God employs to share his, his messages at the times when they need to share it. Um, and this idea of angels in disguise or angels hidden amongst us, um, we can take that and make it, to, make it its own religion, and that's definitely not what's being you know, prescribed here. Uh, but what he's saying is, he's saying to greet the stranger as if you were greeting God himself, or as if you were greeting God's representative. Uh, because not only is he saying that that has happened, but that it will happen. And if we're in the habit of greeting strangers well, then we're good. <laughs> if we're in the habit of greeting strangers poorly, then we never know when we're going to step across and do something contrary to what God would expect, or contrary to what we would want to do if God himself was there. What he's saying is, is we all need to know that we never know when God is right there with us. In fact, we probably should just operate as we hear a lot in Scripture, that he's always right there with us, that there shouldn't be a, a back and forth, a, a way of doing it this way and a way of doing it another way, depending on who's around. We never know uh, what our actions may do, and always God is our audience. He says to continue to remember those in prison as, as if you were together with them in prison, so in other words, those who were in prison both falsely and rightfully accused. Many of them you know, uh, that are in prison, many people that are in prison are there for a reason. Uh, but also, specifically speaking, when you start to think about the apostles, a lot of them had been put in prison. And I guess by the letter of the law of the land in which they lived, they had been guilty of their crime. But a lot of them had been in prison simply for sharing the gospel, simply for proclaiming the name of Jesus. And so he's, he's specifically mentioning them, but he, he, in, in the context of greeting the strangers too, we get this understanding that we are to empathize with people as much as we possibly can. That we should do like God has done with us. That we should, that we should show compassion to them 
wherever they are in whatever situation they're in. He says, and those who are mistreated as if you're, you yourselves were suffering. What that means is, is that it's not just a, a situation where as believers we should sit back and go, well, I'm fine, so everything must be fine with everybody. No, that we should consider, again, our brothers and sisters and the people around us and that we should have empathy and, as we can, sympathy for them in their plights and in the things that they're going through. Not that we should invite suffering on ourselves, but that we should help those and, and identify with those who do suffer. He then jumps into more of a moral idea when it comes to marriage. He says marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Uh, you know, sexual sin is, is with us. Sexual sin is around us. Sexual sin is happening way more than we like to talk about. Uh, it, is, it is present in the world. And, and this is another reminder as we see throughout so many of the New Testament letters that to remind us to keep ourselves pure when it comes to our sexual activity and our sexual habits. Um, and, and God absolutely has a plan and has a pattern for what sex is supposed to be, and he's serious about it, uh, and, and it's real in what he has prescribed and what we are to do and not do. And so he says to, uh, to keep the marriage bed pure and reminds us that God reserves judgment for those who remain in their sexual sin, their sexual immorality. Um, does that mean that we're to, to, you know, us as people hold over the head of other people who we know to be sexually immoral? Of course not. This is God having judgment on them. And so that's, that's when we leave it to God to do the judging. And we simply minister and, and, and try to, again, empathize, empathize with those folks as best we possibly can to help them in the place that they find themselves or the place that maybe they've put themselves, just as we find ourselves in places we put ourselves as well. Uh, he says in verse 5, he says, Keep your lives free from the love of money, greed, uh, and be content with what you have. He gives a reason or a backup to this and says um, that, that, he, that God has said, he reminds us from, from the Old Testament, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. And of course the message in this is that God is with us and so we don't need a bunch of stuff to prop us up because we have God himself. And he's saying that if I'm with you, then you have all you need. Elsewhere, Paul would say that his grace is sufficient. Um, we would see that God is enough, and that's what he's saying here. So don't be greedy about all the things of the world. Understand that if you have faith in Christ, God is with you, and he will take care of you. Does that mean you'll never go hungry? Well, maybe not, but it does mean that he will be with you in fact and in power at all times, and that's to be of great encouragement to us. He says in verse 6, So we say in response to this that he'll never leave us, we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? In other words, the response of the person who has put their faith in God to say, yes, he is enough. I am protected. I am provided for. He is taking care of me and he is calling me to do the things that he's called me to do. And so therefore, this is a, an echoing of agreement with what God has said about who we are in him. He says in verse 7, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Um, this is not just leaders that have offices of, of a church or of a family. These are the people who have shown leadership in our lives to do what? Well, to speak the word of God to us. Now, whether they spoke the word of God by reading it to us or quoting it to us with their actual mouths, or whether they spoke the word of God to us by the way they lived and the way they taught us to live, or simply by the way that they treated us. All of these actions could contribute towards the leadership of one person towards another in getting them and sharing with them the word of God. He says, consider the outcome of their way of life. In other words, look at how they're living and see how it's going for them. We need to make sure we understand that as Christians, <laughs> a lot of times we want to be like, well, don't, you know, don't look around. Don't look at my life. Look at your own life. You take care of your personal stuff. I'll take care of my personal stuff. Here we have scriptural reference that says, no, look at those who are leading you in the Lord and see what they're doing. And as it is good and as it is godly and as it is right, follow their lead. Not, not in a necessarily a situation of authority, but an imitation um, of what we would do to, to continue to grow and how we all serve in faith. He says in verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. 
Jesus has been the same. We see a lot of up and down in our following of Jesus and in the following of Jesus and the people around us. We see a lot of that type of stuff going on, but he is always the same. And so therefore, as we have people who are leading us consistently to him, those are the people we want to imitate. Sadly, we as people find ourselves imitating so many other people so often in imitating things that don't lead us or anybody else to Christ. And the Bible would say, I think the writer of Hebrews would tell us, no, stay away from that and look at the people who are leading you towards the word of God, towards growth in the word of God, towards better, more, more looking like Jesus in your life. Follow them and imitate them. He says in verse 9, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. Everybody take a deep breath. Can we just all agree that there are some strange teachings out there? Uh, there were back then in the first century, and there are certainly 2,000 years later today. There are some strange teachings out there. Um, you know, um, gosh, you know, you start to use an example, but one example leads to seven more that are weirder than those, you know, and just uh, there's so many different things that, that people believe, that people stake their life on, and sometimes things, more often than not, things that people stake their life on and just do without even recognizing the weird belief that's out there. Now, what constitutes a weird belief? To a lot of people, believing in Jesus would be a weird belief. From the standpoint of a Christian, anything that preaches a gospel of salvation through anything or anyone other than Jesus would fit into that, that strange teaching that he's talking about. Um, he says, don't be carried away by those things. That, that's one thing that we need to be careful with as Christians, and one thing that happens in our, in our culture right now Everybody wants to suppose and, and, and practice in a way that they know what's really going on and nobody else really does. And we get all these billions and billions of conspiracy theories. And, and, and there, none of them can be proven or disproven. And so they just swirl around and around and around. It's all this. And, and whatever side we're on, the other side is out to get us, whoever the other side is. We have to, as Christians, be really, really careful because... We don't really have a whole lot of room nor time for a bunch of other theories outside the gospel. Does that mean that we never pay attention to the culture around us and what's going on? Well, no, of course we need to do that, but only so that we can better share the gospel, not so that we can be, you know, the one that said, I told you so way back when, you know, I, yeah, yep, yeah, I saw that was going to happen. We don't get any brownie points in heaven for knowing better than others. What does, quote unquote, get us brownie points, or better yet, what glorifies the Lord, is when we operate and share the gospel. Right now, there, you know, the only conspiracy we really need to be concerned with is the conspiracy that tells people that they can live their life and, and be fulfilled apart from Christ. And the answer to that conspiracy theory, that strange teaching, is the gospel. He says, don't be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, and then he uses this example, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. Um, there, was, there was a lot of, uh, of strange teachings out there in this time about what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat, different types of food and things like that. You, you hear some people argue that, well, if you're a Christian, you can't possibly eat meat. Well, okay, uh, no, <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. I, in fact, I see quite the contrary. But, but what he's saying here is that's just one example of these strange teachings that put undue emphasis on things that don't deserve them. The emphasis in our life and the things that we need to be considering and sharing and, and studying is Christ. And, and if Christ isn't a part of what we're studying, then we're wasting our time. Uh, we may become the biggest expert in the world on, I don't know, pick a theory. But if, it's not, if Christ is not active in that for us and we're believers... It's a waste adventure. And that's hard sometimes for us to consider because we see a lot of value in a lot of these things, and we certainly dominate a lot of conversations with a lot of these theories and thoughts and things like that. But scripturally speaking, the, you know, what God tells us from his word is, is that we need to be focused on Christ and Christ alone and let him permeate into everything else, not go the other way, which is so easy to do, and let the way we think about the world color how we understand Christ and his word. It's a, it's a top-down situation, not a bottom-up type of, of uh, organization there in our thoughts. 
He says in verse 10, we have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. What is he talking about there? That sounds like a very divisive type of thing to say. What he's saying is, is that if we're just simply trying to obey the law and worship God in that way, we're not taking part in the full completion of why the law and the, of the purpose of the law to begin with, which is Christ. And so he's saying that in Christ, we are free from the law. We are free in Christ. We've been made alive, not by trying to do a bunch of righteous deeds and, and check off a list and, and stay away from the breaking these laws, but by simply being made righteous by putting our faith in Christ. And that's that delineation he's making there. He then goes in and talk about some of these earthly law-based ways of worship and comparing them back to Christ. So he's kind of hearkening back to some of the things he said in the early part of the book. And he says, the high priest, in verse 11, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. Now, of course, this was according to the law of Moses, the law of God, the law of the Jewish people that, that founded their, you know, their way of doing worship. This was something that was specifically mentioned in that. You would not keep dead carcasses anywhere inside the, the camp. You would, you would take them outside. Anything that was considered unclean would need to be done outside. Well, he's saying that they, they have all these rules about it. And listen to what he says. He says, uh, and so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. So he's saying that in completing the law and in giving us freedom even from the law, he's fulfilled the law and is, in, is still in keeping with the law. The way that Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection took place didn't break the law. It, it, it stayed in there, and so it's just continuing to, to carry out that thought of Jesus being the ultimate expression and the complete expression of the law that God gave, and that the law pointed out that we couldn't do it, and Jesus came to show that he was the only one that could. He says in verse 13, Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace that he bore. In other words, let us, let us go knowing that we're unclean to the one who makes us clean. And he had to suffer in order to do that. He says, for here we do not have an enduring city, but we're looking for the city that is to come. Now there's a, there's a, a hint in here that's worth mentioning of the difference between what we see and what we do here on earth and what is going to be seen and what we'll be doing in heaven to come. This is not it. We're not trying to make this place the best place that it can be. We are destined and longing for another place. We're, we're not going to stay here, or at least here as we understand here. At some point when Christ returns, he's going to set all things right, and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem. There'll be, he will make all things new. And what he's saying here is, is don't get so tied to the earthly way of doing things and the value of this place because this place is going to be overcome. And us in Christ will be part of overcoming that or will be able to take part in overcoming that, I should say, in him when he decides, that, or when the Father decides and Jesus returns. Um, he says, we're looking for the city that is to come. He says, Though, uh, excuse me, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Now, they had praise in the old testament law that was something that they did we talked about nehemiah and the choirs when they dedicated the wall last week you know praise was a part of it but he says instead of sacrifices of blood and of animals and of you know grains and these other you know earthly things he says let us give a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that openly profess his name in other words let everything that comes out of our mouth be glorifying to god let that be our worship instead of this sacrificial system that Jesus saw once and for all. Um, he says, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is praised. Uh, excuse me, is, ple is pleased, and he's praised. But he says, Say the things that glorify God and do the things that he's required of us to do, which is to, is to love and to serve and to share with others. He goes on to say, Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. Now here's where... Here's where you got to think that the writer of Hebrews had to be a preacher of some Baptist church somewhere. He's like, all right, now listen, let's make sure we respect those preachers, right? <laughs> he's, saying, he's saying, okay, let me, let me just tell you a few things. And he's talking about something that he himself would benefit from, but also that many others would benefit from. It's not a selfish type of thing. He's just saying what is right to do. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. 
We know that in James and in other places in Scripture, we're warned about taking a position of authority because that person, those people in places of authority in God's kingdom, will have to give an account and will be judged more severely and more strictly than those who are not in those leadership positions. And so because of that, when you see people that are leading through their service, that are teaching your Sunday school classes, that are leading your ministries, that are uh, leading music, that are, you know, all the different things that have leadership uh, opportunities in, in the church or in a body of Christ, have confidence in them help them he goes on to say do this so that their work will be a joy not a burden now, now you know it's a preacher right there can you tell he's like man don't make this harder than it has to be right uh, he says do this so their work will be a joy not a burden and he says why and he's just very practical about it here and it makes a lot of sense why would any of us let's say it's our, our father in our house why would we want to make his job difficult what would that help us to do nothing just put everybody on edge and probably get us in a lot more trouble than we would be in if we, if we, you know, than if we just tried to please them and, and, and you know, do what he's saying. We're well, saying that about our church you know, and, and the church in general. Pray for, lift up, support those in all levels of leadership. The servant leadership positions that nobody sees the actions, but they benefit from them. The upfront leadership positions. Help everyone to be able to serve in a way that is joyful because it doesn't help us to make it a big burden or a big hassle to serve the Lord. He says, pray for us, and this is common at the end of a, of a letter like this, an epistle. He says, pray for us. We're sure that we have a clear conscience uh, and a desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. This is someone who has a relationship with these people, um, even though the book of Hebrews has been a lot more formal, has been a lot more... Um, I won't say commanding, but, but it's been much more instructive and authoritative. He does have a relationship with these people, the writer of Hebrews does, uh, and he's hoping to be restored to them, or else he's hoping to be able to come back and visit with them in the near future. And then in the final part of the, of the letter, in the last few, two, few verses of this last chapter, he just closes it out by saying, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of sheep, Whew, everybody breathe because that's a lot of words in one little phrase, right? Or a couple little phrases. What he's saying is the one true God who has given us Jesus, who is our heavenly father, who has, who has allowed Jesus to be sacrificed. Let this one, and then verse 21, what are we letting him do? Let him equip us with everything good for doing his will. That is so key for us as a church. That's so key for us as Christians. We've got to let God equip us. Um, do you remember when David went out to fight Goliath? Do you remember what they did? Um, when he came in, you know, David just came up as a shepherd boy who was bringing some lunch to his brothers who wasn't even supposed to be part of the battle. And so David comes up and, you know, Goliath's making fun of, of all the Israel, you know, Israelite troops and, and, and he's really having his way with them and they're so afraid they won't even do anything about it. And David's like, you know, he's kind of that, that, that you know, kind of headstrong kid. He's like, What's wrong with this? What's wrong with you guys? Why is this guy being able to say all this stuff? You gonna let him talk to us like that? And they see that he's in a position to be bold. And so, what do they do as he's ready to take on this giant? They try to go and fit him with a bunch of armor. Uh, they try to uh, equip him. But what we understand, knowing the story of David and Goliath, is is that God had raised David up with all the skills that he needed to fight Goliath. He didn't need the armor of Saul. He didn't need all the other weapons. What he needed, God had already provided for him. So what does he do? He goes and he gets those five smooth stones and he uses his sling that he was using to protect sheep for years before that. And that's what he uses. God had already given him that equipment. I use that as an illustration to say this. We don't need to try to equip ourselves on top of what God has equipped us with. But we need to concern ourselves, as he's saying, let this God who's given us Christ, who's given us this one who is above all, and given us this ability and, and, and reason to persevere and to stay at the faith, let him be the one who does the equipping in our life, not our own thoughts or somebody else's thoughts about what we should have, what we should do, who we should be. Let it come from the Lord. He says, let him equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him. In other words, not may we do a bunch of good stuff for God, but let him do stuff in us and through us that pleases him. He says, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So be it, as amen is translated. And then the last uh, four verses here, he simply says, Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. In other words, 
Take this as encouragement, but know that it's serious and know that it's important for you and do as we've said, for in fact, I have written to you quite briefly. Now, again, you know he's a preacher because he's been going on for a long time. He acts like he's said something real short. Um, you know, got it done in under an hour, did you, buddy? Good job. <laughs> you know, uh, well, here it is. You know, he's saying that we could spend a lot more time in all of these things we've talked about. But he's saying, I believe that the Lord has gotten his point across. He says, I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. Uh, if he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Some people use that as a thought and, and as part of their uh, understanding that, to think that Paul may have been written here. But of course, Timothy would have known Paul and was, a, you know, was, was one of his uh, mentees, or Paul mentored Timothy. But Timothy also was known amongst all the other brothers in the, you know, in, that were apostles and that were doing the missionary work similar to Paul. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily mean that that's Paul. We don't know. In fact, a lot of scholars say that this was not written by Paul. Um, I'll be honest with you. To me, it really doesn't matter as much who wrote it. It's still true, and it's still God's word, and so it's still worth studying and learning and growing in and, and doing. Uh, he says, Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings, and grace be with you all. And he wraps it up, leaving them encouraged, he, he intends, uh, to continue to stay in the faith, to put Jesus in his rightful spot in their lives as number one above all and, and greater than all and a powerful overall and to keep the faith. Whew. Hebrews has got a lot in it, doesn't it? Just, the, just a little brief wrap-up is a 40-minute uh, Bible study, and, that, and we went through it quick. <laughs> we really did speak briefly about it, believe it or not. Um, so what are you guys' thoughts about what you've heard, either whether you heard it online during the weeks so we weren't able to meet together, the last couple of weeks, uh, as we've been able to talk about Hebrews in, in each other's presence. What, uh, what are some things that you've heard or, or grown in or learned from the book of Hebrews during our study? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, you know how um, verse 9 where it says, do not be carried about with the various strength doctrines? Right. You know how the Lord, you know, tells us this is what we need to go by. Sure. In the Bible. Mm -hmm. The ones that do have other religions, and does their Bible, per se, or whatever they have, warn them about us? Sure. I got to thinking about this. I wonder what they say about us in those, in those For instance, I was about to say, for instance, Islam would refer to anybody who's not in the Islamic faith as infidels. That would qualify Christians, you know, that way too. Uh, most religions, if not all religions, are inclusive and exclusive. In other words, they include those that subscribe to their religion and they exclude everybody else. So it sets up an us and them type of thing. Um, you know, and... and I, I believe that the book of Hebrews, the writer there, and I believe that God from his Holy Spirit would tell us that because he is sharing what is truth with us, that anything else would be a strange teaching, you know, would be in that category. You say, well, wait a minute, they believe what they believe just as I mean, maybe more sincerely than I believe what I believe. Sincerity of belief and subscription to a, serve, you know, to a way of belief doesn't make it more true or not, you know. Um, and that's, that's the huge step of faith we are taking as Christians. And that's, that's that, you know, that agreement that leads to salvation is that, okay, God, I believe that what you've told me and what you tell me is true. Where we really get into some trouble in our culture, though, and, and we're not the only culture that does this. In fact, a lot of other cultures have done it. The Israelites were guilty of it. It's when we start to say, well, yeah, God, I believe that that's good for me, but I also kind of see some things working for some other people out over here, and so we'll let, we'll let them believe what they believe, and well, I believe what I believe. We just won't talk about religion. You heard that before, right? You know, and that's that's something that maybe you might practice, right? Uh, because people believe differently. That what it may while it may help make things a little more comfortable in our family, our workplace, or wherever we may be, that's not a biblical concept. That is a humanist concept that says, well, everybody needs to find their truth. Everybody needs to have their own faith. That, you know, and, 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 and you know, faith is really just something that guides our, our actions. And if it makes us good citizens, well, it doesn't matter if it's Allah, if it's Jesus, or if it's Buddha, you know, whatever. And that's what people say. The Bible speaks very strongly against that because th those would all, anything other than Christ, even Judaism, <laughs> would have been considered a strange teaching, you know, in light of what, what we see in Christ. That uh, that seems harsh for us to say. 
But well, if it's, I, just, I just never really have thought about it. Yeah. Other religions, what they say about us. Oh, yeah. Well, well, they're I, studying. Hindu, I, I worked with, you know, Hindu people, and they would actually uh, talk about uh, family, I guess you'd say church or whatever. more severe than we are. <laughs> they actually would it. I mean, there are parts of the world where if you profess Christ, your family is responsible to put you to death. Or if you profess anything other than what they believe. I mean, you know, whether it be a tribal type of religion or whether it be sometimes it may be Islam or other, you know, other faiths. Um, you know, everybody wants to try to explain things and, and, and explain why things are, how things came to be. Um, what we trust as Christians is, is that the Word of God has given us all that explanation that we need. And again, where we get into trouble is we say, oh, well, yeah, I've read that and I get that, but also, but instead of, but, well, what it really means is, ooh, be careful when you say what it really means. And I, I mean, I'm convicted every time I even try to, even after, after having studied, you know, both in short term and long term, I'm convicted when I tell you, you know, what, try to tell you what the Bible's saying because I want to make sure I'm telling you what it's actually saying. Uh, and I know I mess up. I know, you know, I know I probably, you know, get it wrong sometimes, maybe more times than I'd like to admit. Um, but, but again, that's why it comes back to Scripture as authority and not the teachings of some man or woman or some group, um, not tradition, not, you know, all these other things. It, it all comes back to Scripture because the Word of God has been around and has been preserved by Him and you know, has endured. Uh, sure enough. Sure enough. That's a good. That's a good point, though. Yeah. 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 I, I, I don't know. I guess I've never really thought about it till, till now. What they study. Yeah. Yeah. And they do. The saddest I've ever, I, I ever was. There was two two occasions when I was working uh, in the Middle East muslim guy and one was with a, a, a hindu girl from india lady both married both had a family and i talked to both of them about you know christianity and the hindu lady said to me she said oh no i could never have been my family to disown me they would throw her out and that, that was her only reason for not even wanting to hear about jesus the Muslim guy, on the other hand, he said, I'll never forget as long as I live, he looked at me and he said, we know you're Jesus. And he was a good prophet. He was a great prophet. But we believe, we hope, we hope that if we follow the teachings of Islam, that we'll go to forever and ever. I said, well, we don't hope. <laughs> I did, I mean. And that's where Christianity separates itself from all the other world religions is in the person of Jesus. And so it's why, um, you know, uh, we talked about in Sunday school this morning that we, we preach Christ crucified. Why is it important that it was Christ crucified? Because of who he is and who he was that no one else can be and no one else has been. The book of Hebrews stations him right where he belongs, above every high priest, above every earthly authority. Uh, you know, it, it, it continues that theme throughout Scripture that God is supreme over all. There's no compromising. You know, there's no other way or there's no, um, you know, back door into heaven, you know, that type of thing. And, and that, I think that's important for us to think about, too, as we witness to other people. Because as we witness to others, we may be speaking from a point that they've been raised to believe is wrong, is sinful, is, is, you know, just as if they were trying to, you know, come to our door and talk us into, you know, believing something other than the Bible, you know, so we just need to know that's reality. It doesn't need to keep us from sharing our faith, because if we believe it's strong enough and, you know, sufficient enough to save us, then it's sufficient enough and strong enough to share with others. Um, but we just need to know where everybody is coming from as best we can to help us be better in how we share our faith. Well, the message is simple. Man is the one who's complicated. Mm -hmm. The message through our religion and, and all these things, the message is simple. Jesus died for your sins. If you don't believe it, you ain't going to hell. Yep. It's pretty simple. Uh, we, we 
get add in, add in everything else. Yep. Well, I mean, you're raised, we're raised to follow what's in here. And I guess I forget a lot of times, a lot of these countries don't have this. No. They, they don't. And it's not by their, that, their fault. I mean, and I guess, I guess we're so lucky that we have this Bible to guide us, whereas a lot of people don't. And, and I think that'll bring us on the flip side of that that brings us into a stronger position of judgment, you know, not for us to judge, but to be judged because we do have access to it. You know, the Bible's in more places than it's ever been, but it's still not in a lot of places. Um, and so therefore it puts the onus on us to make sure that we're taking and, and doing with it as we should. We can all do so much more. I know I can. Uh, we, we all can. Well, guys, I have enjoyed being with you this evening, and I hope that you have a great week. If you need anything, let us know. Continue to pray for those. Grady, as he finishes his last treatment, and Jan, as she recovers. Uh, Miss Tina, who uh, is dealing with some illness as well. Pray for Miss Shirley as she gets, that hopefully, that good report from her doctor and that they let her know what's going on if it's her back and you know, that it would be something they can take care of. And for each of us as we go forward and, and as we go and, and share our faith as we, as we you know, live in the world. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you, Lord, and we thank you that you are working in our midst. Continue to do so and go with us as we leave this place. Help us to glorify you in all we do. Be with those who are suffering. Help us to consider them as well and to serve as you call us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.